have uh, come to the last lecture today, which um, I must say I'm especially proud of be able to present James Corbett. I have written to him for three years to have him to come. <laughs> Last year he had a good reason because they had a little baby. I still do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, there was quite, how many of you follow James, Paul, uh, James Corbett on reasonable basis? See, James, a lot of fans here. And uh, I think most of you will say, is there any subject James don't know anything about? Yeah, that is, so, um, and I think everybody is looking forward to this, uh, this brain you have with sharp analyzing based on solid research and even presented in an easy way to understand, even for Danes. Yeah, as you saw, you had a lot of supporters from here. Uh, maybe you don't see it too much in your comment field or blogs, uh, because Danes, they don't blog. Um, but I will say, I think we are many people here who are looking forward to hear James Corbett's lecture echoes of World War One, and um, your analysis of what is going on in big politics and uh, what can we inspect in the future. So please give a warm welcome to James Corbett. All right. All right. Good evening. Let me start by thanking all of the staff and organizers and volunteers and Frank and Michael and Greg and all of the people who have put this together. It's an incredible amount of work to put a conference like this together, so I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be here tonight to talk to you. And, of course, thank you to all of you for having made the effort to come out and see me tonight. I very much appreciate that. Uh, you, uh, I arrived in Denmark a few days ago and my entire understanding of Denmark comes from things like the philosophy of Soren Kierkegaard and the fairy tales of Hans Christian Andersen, and the political machinations of Anders Fogg Rasmussen, and <laughs> the films of Lars von Trier. So you will, you will forgive me if I was a little bit hesitant as to what to expect when coming here, but... I'm pleased to report that the Danish people overall have been exceptionally generous and hospitable, and I very much appreciate all of the, uh, the kindness that has received me so far. So I'm looking forward to talking to you tonight, but with all of that pleasantness out of the way, let's turn to the unpleasantness of today's topic. It may be observed that our relations with Germany, if not exactly cordial, have at least been practically free from all symptoms of direct friction. And there is an impression that Germany will think twice before she now gives rise to any fresh disagreement. In this attitude, she will be encouraged if she meets on England's part with unvarying courtesy and consideration in all matters of common concern, but also with a prompt and firm refusal to enter into any one-sided bargains or arrangements, and the most unbending determination to uphold British rights and interests in every part of the globe. And these are the words of this man, Sir Eyre Crow, who was a, uh, a high-ranking officer in the British Foreign Office uh, in that period in the run-up to World War I and he was commissioned by Edward VII, King Edward VII, the royal rake, the brothel-goer-in-chief, to write a memorandum on the present state of British relations with France and Germany, which he delivered to British Foreign Secretary Sir Edward Grey on January 1st, 1907. And as you can see, even at that time, several years before the outbreak of World War I, the foreign office and the various military planners were very much thinking along the lines, even within their diplomatic gobbledygook, of being firm with the Germans. Fast forward to today. And we have a hundred years from now, this is what they'll remember, what we did to confront China on its rise to world domination. 
China right now is Germany in 1930, and we're going to war in the South China Sea in five to ten years. Interesting pronouncements, and I would perhaps aver that perhaps China right now is Germany in 1910, but、uh, at any rate, I think the sentiment is well taken. And these are the observations of that top-ranking, prestigious geopolitical commentator of our times, Steve Bannon. <laughs> What swamp did he crawl out of exactly, anyway?、Um, But if that's a bit too cartoonish, let's go even more cartoonish. Of course, looking back at the propaganda of a previous age, it seems almost quaint by today's standards that anyone was moved by these images rather than laughing at their ridiculous, over-the-top nature. We have the germ Huns, not Germans, germ Huns, literal germs, lice that need to be disinfected. We have the Schweinhund, bring home the bacon. We have、uh, the brutes, the mad brutes, who are literally going to take our virtuous women and have their way with them, unless we stop them. This is the Huns are coming, the propaganda of a hundred plus years ago. But today we are sophisticated. We don't rely on this kind of crude propaganda. We have much more well-crafted, shrewd propaganda with a nice little techno beat to go along with it. If That's your thing. Tonight at ten, a rare glimpse of China's ambitious expansion in one of the world's most contested regions. We report from the South China Sea, where the Chinese are warning off anyone who comes too close to their building program. We continue our look this morning at what China does not want you to see. The United States says the superpower is reclaiming land in the South China Sea. China's alarming creation of entirely new territory in the South China Sea is one part of a broader military push that some fear is to challenge U.S. dominance in the region. I firmly believe that our People's Liberation Army has the confidence and capability to defeat all invading enemies. They've staked a claim to thousands of acres of what were sandbars and reefs. They've used sophisticated equipment like these ships pumping sand through those thin tubes to create islands. Then they built airfields with towering radar stations, constructed ports, deployed weapons there, even built barracks. The fact that we're dealing with a situation right now where we, the U.S., has to be much more aggressive in dealing with the Chinese government. So as you see, this is nothing like the propaganda of a century ago. It's、uh, much slicker, but propaganda it is nonetheless. This is echoes of World War I, China, the U.S., and the next great war. And the thesis that I'm going to present to you tonight is not is not a wholly original thesis for the most part. You're not going to、uh, you are going to see this, in fact, increasingly talked about probably from this point. And it has been talked about by such prestigious figures as Heinz Kissinger himself. And I'll spare you for my impersonation of Mr. Kissinger. But、uh, in 2011, he wrote his weighty tome on China, and in the epilogue to that tome, he wrote about that same Crow mem- memorandum that we opened tonight with,、uh, asking the question: Does history repeat itself? And he asked the question. A number of commentators, including some in China, have re-、uh, revisited the example of the 20th century Anglo-German rivalry as an augury of what may await the United States and China in the 21st century. There are surely strategic comparisons to be made. At the most superficial level, China is, as was Imperial Germany, a resurgent continental power. The United States, like Britain, is primarily a naval power with deep political and economic ties to the continent. He goes on to ask, "Will history repeat itself? No doubt, were the、uh, United States and China to fall into strategic conflict, a situation co- comparable to the pre-World War I European structure could develop in Asia, with the formation of blocs pitted against each other, and with each seeking to undermine or at least limit the other's influence and reach." But before we surrender to the presumed mechanism of history, blah blah blah. He goes on to say, "Don't worry, guys. It might not develop into warfare." Um, which is a remarkably similar note to one that was struck quite recently, just in the past few months, by a new book by Graeme Ellison, with the foreboding title of "Destined for War."
can uh, America and China escape Thucydides' trap? And, well, Thucydides, who's that? This is, of course, the 5th century BC Athenian historian and general, and he's best known for writing the history of the Peloponnesian War, which is commonly referred to as the first work of scientific history, the use, the collection, and the, the examination of evidence and facts from the historical record to come to an understanding of the cause and uh, effect flow of history. Why, why did this happen? How did this happen? Rather than in previous historical works, just invoking the gods to explain when and then this happened. So this is a, uh, a, a, an important writer and a landmark in the history of history. And as a result, it's still taught to this day in army war colleges in the United States and elsewhere. And it's even the history of the Peloponnesian War has been referred to as the favorite neoconservative text on foreign affairs by none other than Irving Kristol. So it probably is. And the question is, what is Thucydides' trap? Well, uh, as Graham Ellison writes in the preface to his book, as a rapidly ascending China challenges America's accustomed predominance, these two nations risk falling into a deadly trap, first identified by the ancient Greek historian Thucydides. Writing about a war that devastated the two leading city-states of classical Greece two and a half millennia ago, he explained, it was the rise of Athens and the fear this instilled in Sparta that made war inevitable. Inevitable. Which is uh, an interesting word to be using. And to be fair, Graham Allison goes on, like Henry Kissinger, to say, well, it's not necessarily 100% the case that we're going to war with China. In the book, he uh, elaborates, I believe, 16 different examples of this Thucydides trap event in the past 500 years of a ruling power being challenged by a rising power. And of those 16 examples, 12 of them resulted in war, four did not. So he presents that as a learning opportunity. How can we discover, well, why did it not go to war in these cases? I think some of the cases that he cites are uh, a long stretch uh, to describing the current situation. Um, for example, the rise of Germany as an economic power in the European Union, displacing the economic power of Britain and France in recent decades, I think is not quite as relevant as, say, the World War I example is to what we see developing with China. But at any rate, this idea has been forwarded by people like Graham Ellison and has been heavily promoted in the last few months. If you go on YouTube, you'll find just in the past few months a number of conversations that Graham Ellison has had about this book that have been hosted by people like CIA Director David Petraeus, or ex-CIA Director, disgraced CIA Director David Petraeus, and Miss Humanitarian Love Bombing herself, Samantha Power, and Henry Kissinger. So this idea is right now being heavily promoted by some people who are in a position to know, which is interesting because I did select the, uh, the, the topic for this presentation before this book even came out. Great minds think alike? Hmm. At any rate, if there are similarities between the build-up to World War I and our current historical era, what would those similarities entail? Well, we can identify, for example, the phenomenon of the Thucydides trap, a rising power coming to challenge the dominance of a ruling power, uh, entangling alliances that enmesh these various powers in webs that make it more likely that they'll lead to con confrontation. There's competition in a military sense, competition for resources, trade competition, and an invasion hysteria that is being whipped up in the public by a complacent media. So I think we can identify all of these things in the pre-World War I period and in today's period. And let's get into some more specifics. So the idea of the Thucydides trap, the rising power that's coming to displace or threatening to displace a ruling power. If we're examining it in the World War I context, of course, we're talking about the rising power of Germany coming to threaten the then dominant power of the British Empire. And there's a lot of different ways that we can formulate that uh, statistically or uh, try to encapsulate that on um, looking at gross domestic product of Germany as compared to Britain, for example, in that period from 1860 to 1913, keeping in mind that Germany as a nation state only actually came together in 1871, which of course kicked off the period of rapid industrialization that caused a rapid growth in economic and military 
clout of, uh, of the German, formerly German states, now German state, uh, which was presumably the cause for the, the panic that, that uh, ensued. So looking at GDP, you'll see that uh, Britain was always able to maintain a healthy gap between uh, British GDP and German GDP until, until we approach the, uh, the turn of the 20th century, at which point Germany uh, continues on a parabolic upward curve, whereas Britain is putting its might into trying to increase uh, economic productivity, but not, not uh, doing quite as well. And at that point, around 1910 or so, Germany actually overtakes Britain in terms of GDP. Uh, if you want to look at the military side of things, uh, German and British warship tonnage, because of course this was primarily and I think famously a naval race, uh, Britain was able to maintain uh, a hefty lead over all other nations, including Germany in naval, uh, in naval capacity, but Germany did put on quite a show and certainly uh, did massively increase its naval capabilities just in really in the last decade and a half before the war. Um, so these things were obviously seen as concerning, alarming, perhaps, depending on what position you were in, in the British aristocracy or uh, cacistocracy. Uh, similarly, if you want to compare that to today, the idea of a rising power of China coming to threaten to displace the ruling power of the American empire. And again, we can map this out in various ways. Again, if we want to turn to gross domestic product, uh, a very inaccurate measure by any means. It's not really a measure so much as an estimate, and even then there are different ways of estimating GDP. So that if you measure GDP in purchasing power parity, for example, PPP, uh, various groups, including I believe the IMF and World Bank, have estimated that China has already surpassed the US economy. But even if we're to measure GDP in nominal terms, uh, the Rothschild economist uh, reckons that by next year, 2018, China will meet and then surpass uh, the US gross domestic product of $20 trillion. So we're just on the verge of that takeover. And keep in mind, Germany surpassed uh, Britain just a few years before the outbreak of war. Uh, if we want to look at military capacity, military buildup, I don't think there's any satisfactory way of encapsulating this in a handy dandy infographic. And I think every infographic I've ever seen that tries to do so does so in a very ham handed way. There's a lot of ways that you could dispute what information is trying to be conveyed here. But I think the general idea that China is becoming more of a military, I don't want to say adversary or threat, but at least uh, a power that's capable of projecting its, its might within its own region, at any rate, is certainly a phenomenon that we're witnessing. Uh, this graphic that I have here displays, uh, for example, the ground forces of the Chinese PLA, the People's Liberation Army, are just by sheer numbers larger than the US, as would be expected given the fact that China has a population over three times that of the US. So more actual uh, uh, troops themselves, all members of the, the forces, more artillery and battle tanks. Um, but I think that's, again, I think that's a misleading statistic in a lot of ways. Uh, when it comes to the naval side of things, I think, again, clear superiority on the U.S. side. Um, but China is gradually catching up in various ways, and you can see that reflected, for example, in submarine figures and things like that. But when it comes to destroyers and combat aircraft and aircraft carriers and these types of things, again, the U.S. naval dominance, I think, is not really in question at this point and is not feasibly in question in the near future. But I think the idea is that China is at least becoming more militarily capable. Uh, if we want to talk about entangling alliances, uh, this is probably about as deep into the history of the world, uh, First World War that, well, at least I received back in my Canadian education, the indoctrination. Um, the Triple Entente and the Triple Alliance. So you had Germany and Austria-Hungary and Italy uh, forming pacts in the 1870s, 1880s that became the backbone of the Triple uh, Alliance. And then you had Russia and France and Britain forming the Triple Entente, and they had different relations to the Balkans and Bulgaria and Serbia and 
the Ottoman Empire is in there and all the dates are in there, so there will be a test after this. Please study very carefully. Uh, it, the Venn diagram is confusing enough, but it could be made much more confusing when you add in other relevant parts of this uh, diagram, which would include Japan and Belgium and how they slotted into this. Um, but it's tempting to just say, okay, so there was an alliance and there was an entente and they, it kind of led everyone into war. I believe Kissinger called it the diplomatic doomsday machinery that led to World War I, as if it just suddenly appeared somehow and it was just a fait accompli and it goes. Um, but I think that's a, a glossing over an exceptionally for people who want to study the actual history of the period, it's exceptionally important to just even look at some of the dates that form around these. For example, look at Britain and France and Russia forming that Triple Entente, and think, even in the 1890s, even in the early 1900s, 1901, 1902, the idea that Britain and France would be forming any type of alliance or Entente or whatever it may be called, after a thousand years of military confrontation and struggle is, is something. That is something. How did that come about? Or Britain and Russia, which had been squabbling over Afghanistan and Persia and coming head to head in various other places, suddenly becoming best buddies and becoming joined at the hip. That's, that's a fascinating part of the puzzle for people who want to know what was World War I really about? How did it really come about? Who was behind the creation of those alliances. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but there's quite a bit of detail there that we could go into. Um, but at any rate, this is the entangling alliances that generally, the story that we've all heard, there was an assassination in Sarajevo on the 28th of June, 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and bada bing, bada boom, entangling alliances, World War. Okay, well, that's not a very satisfactory explanation, is it? Uh, if you want to Compare that to today, the entangling alliances of the pre-World War III period, question mark. Again, I'm not sure there's a single graphic that could possibly encapsulate this idea because there are so many different possibilities, um, alliances of various sorts. One way of graphing that might be to look at the NATO member countries, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, versus the Shanghai Cooperation Organization members. The NATO, of course, coming together in the Cold War period as a North Atlantic Security Alliance, increasingly erroneously named because at the moment uh, it's probably most infamously embroiled in the occupation of Afghanistan. North Atlantic? I, I don't know. Someone buy them a map. Um, but, and, and this graphic isn't even really representative because, yes, the NATO member countries might be those countries, but now it has these strategic partnerships and alliances with various players all over the globe. Korea and everywhere else have these, these quasi-alliances with NATO that, that uh, make it a truly globe-expanding organization at this point. And uh, I've talked about that with Rick Rosoff, for example, on my podcast before, so um, it's, it's quite... It's quite an amazing thing to watch, not an amazing in a good way, perhaps, but the creation of this NATO monstrosity. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization, on the other hand, is sometimes referred to as a kind of counterbalance to NATO. I, I think that might be a bit overblown, at least at this point, but it is some form of political, economic, and military cooperation agreement uh, body that, of course, includes China and Russia and some of their pals there in Eurasia. Uh, that's one way of graphing this. We, there, as I say, there are many different things that we could be looking at. We could be looking at the European Union, we could be looking at uh, the BRICS, we could be looking at uh, organizations that span both China and Russia, um, from the United Nations to the World Trade Organization and others like that. How do we make sense of that? And what does that mean if this does come to actual confrontation? Um, not so clear, but at any rate, I think the idea of entangling alliances could be said to exist today. It's just a question of which alliances would be activated in which way by what kind of event. If we want to look at military competition, in the pre-World War I period, there was no doubt there was a massive military buildup across the board. Uh, every single one of the major powers of Europe was arming steadily, and uh, the figures might be difficult to read on this map, but uh, for example, uh, the UK uh, going from $308 million in contemporary U.S. dollar spending in 1908 to $368 million in 1913. Germany going from 356 
56 uh, million dollars to 573 million dollars. Uh, across the board, everyone was arming feverishly, perhaps no one more feverishly than Germany itself, um, for various reasons. I mean, clearly, again, this was a build-up to war period in which it was quite evident that Germany was in the crosshairs, and I think they could read the tea leaves as to what was happening. So, again, military competition, military build-up, quite certainly from our perspective, quite easy to see. And I think even in, at the time, it was easy to see and notice what was happening. Uh, military competition in our own era, how do we graph that? Well, we can look at regional military expenditures from 1988 to 2012 and see that North American region has uh, in, enjoyed a much, a very, very robust military expenditure increase since 2001, for reasons that should be obvious. Uh, and keep in mind when we're talking about North American military expenditures, we are talking about American military expenditures. Canadian and Mexican military expenditures would not even be a blip on that chart. And the other region that has had prominent and strong growth during the entire period is the Asia and Oceania region. And again, when we're talking about the Asia Pacific region and military expenditures, we are primarily talking about China, as you can see in this other graph where uh, yes, there's been some increase in military spending from India, a little bit of increase in Vietnam and places like this, but by far the lion's share of increase in military expenditure has been coming from China. So we have the picture here of the US and China definitely engaged in military buildup. Now, let's keep the relative figures in mind because, again, the United States military expenditure dwarfs absolutely any and all competitors. China is number two at this point but number two by a very, very long shot, and the U.S. military expenditure of the official expenditure over, over $600 billion a year at this point, um, and that's just the official on the books expenditures. Uh, I can't remember how many, but on the order of the next 10 largest military expenditures combined uh, is about equivalent to the, what the U.S. is spending every single year. So again, let's keep the figures in mind, but from the perspective of a ruling power being threatened or being feeling threatened by a rising power, any sort of bridging of that gap, however minuscule, could be seen to be part of this picture that we're painting here. Uh, if we want to talk about resource competition, uh, pre-World War I, perhaps most notably uh, in the age of neo-imperialism at the turn of the 20th century, the late 19th century, uh, most notably taking place in Africa, specifically the scramble for Africa that was taking place uh, from the point, uh, from the Berlin Conference in 1884 onwards when the colonial powers agreed to their gentlemanly rules of how to carve up and uh, control the African continent. So of course every uh, colonial power and would-be colonial power of the time was scrambling to get its claws into the African continent. Uh, obviously, France uh, taking a good portion of the northwest of the continent. Uh, Britain obviously represented in the east and in South Africa as a result of the Boer War, which is an interesting part of the World War I story that uh, many people might not, uh, might not think of as part of the World War I story. Uh, even the Danish colonial empire, of course, having its holdings on the Gold Coast of Africa. But Perhaps most notably, Germany, which again, let's keep in mind, was only, only consolidated as a nation state in 1871 by this period in the 1880s, 1890s, scrambling for its own colonial holdings in Africa, reading the mercantilist uh, tea leaves and re realizing they needed to uh, take part in this colonial quest. Uh, you had German West Africa, German Southwest Africa, German East Africa, and German New Guinea that were carved out. So that that is a nice microcosm, I think, of the overall picture of the, the resource competition that was taking place generally, but certainly in Africa in the 1880s and 1890s, it was becoming most evident. And as a result, of course, that's the point at which certain conflicts started to come to the fore, like Germany and France in Morocco, uh, which was a, a presage of the, the, what would become the First World War in some respects. If we want to look in our own era, the idea of resource competition, again, I think Africa would be a good way of looking at this. And on the left, we have a map of the uh, in various investments or investment proposals that China has ongoing in the African continent, spread out across 
a large section of the continent and involving all sorts of different infrastructure projects and other, other uh, uh, projects that will ultimately result in what China likes to call a win-win situation. China gets the resources, they get to buy the resources, but Africa gets the investment of infrastructure and other things. Uh, that's the China in Africa map. And then on the right side, we have the US in Africa map, which if you do an image search for the idea of US presence in Africa in their current day and age, you'll find invariably, this is a map of US military presence in Africa. And even then, somewhat, maybe not a complete map, but uh, this is the uh, sub-Saharan nations currently with the US military presence is represented here. But of course, we know that the US, for example, has obviously had its uh, claws into Libya and Egypt and elsewhere on the continent in recent years besides, and has, you know, since 2007, established the US African Command as part of the military uh, quest to consolidate control on the African continent which is widely uh, seen, and even in the mainstream media, reported as a type of counterbalance or a block uh, in the road of China and its development uh, in Africa. And this is something that obviously is not lost on the Africans themselves. Um, Muammar Gaddafi, in 2007, in an address to the students at Oxford University, actually made this point about how there are two models that are vying for control in Africa. There's the Chinese model, which is about infrastructure investment and spending and cooperation. And there's the US model, which is based on military occupation and bombs and, and bullets. And he said, quote, because of that soft approach, Africans are welcoming China warmly. This will no doubt be to China's benefit. Africans are wary of the US because of its harsh approach. This is proof of the folly of American policy. And we all know what happened to Gaddafi four years later at the hands of the NATO-backed goons that were sent into his country. So, making his point for him, perhaps. If we want to talk about trade competition in the pre-World War I period, we would have to include at least some discussion of the Berlin-Baghdad Railway, which, despite its name, was a proposed railway from Berlin all the way down to the Persian Gulf of, uh, city of Basra via Baghdad, uh, that was the result of a concession that was won from the, the Turkish Ottoman Empire government uh, by Deutsche Bank, which was spearheading was a group of investors that were looking for this concession to create this railway. In the 1880s, it started to come together. And this was seen as exceptionally important for Germany in a number of ways, one of which, on even a surface level, of course, Germany uh, needing export markets for its growing industrial production. Turkey could provide um, some, some market for that. But also, this being a, a line down to the Persian Gulf, which would potentially, assuming things were to develop as they had been developing and the age of neo-imperialism continued, Germany would need some sort of direct access to its colonial holdings into its trading partners around the world. The Persian Gulf would be a nice place to go from, so this would be a very strategic asset for Germany overall. Uh, as part of the concession, they actually got, I believe, 20 miles on either side of the railway that would include mineral rights and oil uh, rights in a very oil-rich region, so lucrative in that sense as well. Uh, Britain looked at this Berlin-Baghdad railway proposal and said, oh my god, you t it's not just you can put uh, you know, freight production on these trains and send them down there. You can send soldiers down there, and that's what they're planning. So Brit Britain was very worried that uh, Germany would use this for some sort of military strike, threatening uh, the Suez Canal, perhaps, and uh, threatening to cut off British access to its Indian uh, colony, or, uh, or cutting off uh, supply lines for it. The oil, which was increasingly important even at that time, as Britain had just switched its navy from coal-fired vessels to oil-powered vessels. Uh, the story of the undermining and scuttling and ultimate irrelevance of the Berlin-Baghdad Railway is something that I told it in part in the How Big Oil Conquered the World documentary, so if you're interested in a little bit of more history about that, you can consult that documentary. But suffice it to say, it did eventually actually get completed uh, in 1940, but by that point it was not exactly the strategic asset that 
pre-World War I Germany was looking for. If we want to look at the comparison to today, trade competition in the pre-World War III era, Obor, Obor, Obor. If you haven't heard of Obor yet, you are going to. Starting tonight and probably a lot in the near future. One belt, one road, specifically the Silk Road Economic Belt and the Maritime Silk Road Initiative of China, which is a plan to create this vast uh, trading, trade routes, uh, both over land and overseas, that will consolidate Chinese uh, shipping and trading in the entire region. It's a grand, incredibly audacious project, which could be up to a trillion dollars of investment overall when all is said and done, and includes all sorts of infrastructure projects in all sorts of different places. If you want to look at a Berlin-Baghdad parallel to what's going on today, just earlier this year, the first freight train made the 12,000-kilometer journey from Beijing to London. So the Beijing-London railway is already in existence. Uh, if you want to look at other elements of this, uh, China just last month opened a naval base in Djibouti. Why would China be interested in opening a naval base in Djibouti? You do not have to be a keen geopolitical st strategist to understand, just from looking at a map, the incredible strategic importance of Djibouti uh, there on the Gulf of Aden with the, I always forget, Bob, Bob El Mandeb Strait, uh, which of course is very important uh, to have, if not control over, at least access to uh, if you are planning to ship resources, say, out of Africa up to Pakistan and then on to China. It's an extremely, exceptionally important part to have a, uh, a naval base in, which is presumably why that has just been opened. Uh, all sorts of other projects taking place. Uh, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor alone, $60 billion of proposed investment so far. Uh, everything that's taking place in the region right now seems to be under this one belt, one road initiative idea. So it is massively transforming the entire region, uh, including Southeast Asia, including Eurasia. And uh, that's a pretty significant thing. If we want to talk about invasion hysteria, the whipping up of panic about the, 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 the enemy, uh, in Britain, that was taking place in the pre-World War I period through the auspices of various media organs, including the Daily Mail, which commissioned the, uh, the publication of The Invasion of 1910 by Mr. William Lecuel. This was a, uh, a story that was serialized in the Daily Mail in 1906, and it was the fictional account of an invasion of the eastern shores of England by those dastardly Germans. And uh, I just have the sort of regular looking cover here, but uh, in my copy of Hidden History, uh, The Secret Origins of World War I, there's a picture of a different version of that cover where it's Kaiser Wilhelm holding the globe, literally about to take a bite out of it like an apple because he's so rapacious for land that he just can't contain himself. He's going to eat the world. Um, which gives you, I think, a sense of the, what this story is about and what it's uh, attempting to do. And it was wildly, wildly, massively successful in that endeavor. Uh, it was sold through ridiculous tactics. Uh, newspaper vendors dressed up in complete Prussian military garb with a spiked helmet and everything to sell these newspapers. And it was massively popular when it w came out in book form. Again, a massive bestseller. Uh, it was commissioned specifically by... Uh, let me get the name correct here. Uh, Al Alfred Harmsworth, a.k.a. Lord Northcliffe, who was part of, who became part of the clique, the set that was clearly engineering the conditions for World War I. And this is no small part of it, whipping the public into a hysteria about the enemy that's coming for them. So is there invasion hysteria in our own era? You bet there is. Uh, Pieces of literary gold like Invasion by Eric L. Harry or Invasion China by Von Heppner. It's so imaginatively entitled. Um, and I will confess I haven't read these turgid tomes of No Doubt Trash, uh, but I suppose I will have to. The things that I do for you guys, I swear. I suppose I'll have to stomach through some of it just to see the, uh, the gist of it, but I, I think we can tell, even from the cover art, let alone the reviews, etc., what these uh, 
pieces of, uh, of writing are attempting to do. Perhaps most interestingly, and the one that will go to the top of the to read list, is Ghost Fleet, a novel of the next world war by P.W. Singer and August Cole. And this, is a, this seems to be a particularly interesting one because as the foreignpolicy.com website uh, wrote about last year, and for, for you to, those of you who don't know, foreignpolicy.com, very much a globalist mouthpiece. Uh, Kiss, Kissinger's mini-me, David Rothkopf, was the, I believe, the founder or co-founder, at any rate, the chief editor for a number of years. He stepped down, I think, earlier this year, but still, clearly a globalist mouthpiece. And they had a piece on Ghost Fleet last year, in which, uh, which was titled, A Novel About War with China Strikes a Chord at the Pentagon. And they note that U.S. military officers are reading Ghost Fleet as a cautionary tale on how to prepare for great power clashes in the digital age. Which is made all the more interesting because neither P.W. Singer nor August Cole are actually novelists. They have no previous experience with fiction writing. They just found themselves writing this for some reason. P.W. Singer is a military analyst known for his nonfiction books. And August Cole was a former Wall Street Journal defense reporter. And as uh, foreignpolicy.com notes, the Ghost Fleet is unusual for a work of fiction because it is uh, loaded with nearly 400 footnotes meticulously documenting the real world roots of the fictional fights. You want to talk about predictive programming? That sounds like one to add to the film literature New World Order series. So yes, invasion hysteria, but if fiction is not your thing, there's nonfiction invasion hysteria as well. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is Peter Navarro, the author of such works as The Coming China Wars and Death by China. <laughs> a very, very subtle writer in so many ways. Really beautiful use of language. Uh, no, he, he is an economist who writes about the economic aspects of the Chinese threat to the American uh, economic hegemon, and he writes about counterfeit goods and uh, China currency manipulation and th issues like this in a very tabloidy, trash talk style. I wouldn't recommend that you read him, but if you do, uh, I guess I could say that he writes kind of psychedelic fever dreams of a particularly sinophobic William Burroughs, like Naked Lunch, China, Target China edition or something. Uh, I don't know how to describe it, but uh, many, many years ago, I was in Canada, in my hometown, and I was at a used bookstore or a flea market or something, and I came across a book that the cover was so gripping I just had to buy it. It was a dollar or something, so why not? It was the, the, the title was dot, 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 to hell with Canada. <laughs> and the, uh, the book was the most bizarre rant of some crotchety old man. I don't know, I, I'm assuming this was some self-published book or something. It was just so bizarre. And I remember one of the points that he made was that uh, uh, these, these hockey players are flying all over the country going to their games. We should scrap the National Hockey League and save jet fuel. <laughs> it was bizarre. I, I should, should see if I still have that book, actually. Dig it out. But that's, that's kind of what the style that Peter Navarro reminds me of. He reminds me of that bizarre crotchety old man creating these strange visions and although you can't really read this this is a screenshot from the coming china wars where he's writing about the problem of counterfeit goods coming from china and he says to understand the very real dangers of these counterfeit goods consider these fictional scenarios which he assures us are all based on real world events although this book contains absolutely no footnotes unlike Ghost Fleet, which has 400 footnotes. So whatever real world events these are based on, I don't know. And how did he fictionalize them? I don't know. But it starts off, it's a list of fictional scenarios that he's created, which starts off fairly, fairly innocuously. It seems plausible enough. Uh, your scalp de de develops a, a severe rash because your knockoff head and shoulder shampoo from China contains toxic chemical residue. OK, fair enough, I'm sure. I'm sure that things like that do happen. Uh, then he gets progressively weirder in his f fictional scenarios here. He t writes about a Himalayan lap, your Himalayan lap cat dying from liver failure due to Chinese poisoned tick medicine. We can all relate to that one. 
And he ends on this fictional scenario, which I hope I can read without laughing. On a sultry summer night, two of your coworkers, a 22-year-old gay man and a 24-year-old heterosexual woman, buy fake Durex extra safe condoms at the same pharmacy. At the same pharmacy. Later that night, in separate encounters, the condom burst. The gay man gets HIV, and the woman contracts chlamydia, which renders her sterile. <laughs> These are the fictional scenarios that he's, he, can, he spends all night dreaming about, I'm sure. Um, just bizarre. And it's funny, it's laughable, it's stupid. If it weren't for the fact that Peter Navarro is Trump's National Trade Council head. He is the head of the National Trade Council in the United States now. Death by China, indeed. So, if this is what is happening, and if we do see these parallels, what can we learn from the history of World War I about what we are experiencing now and what we may experience in the near future? Well, this is a piece of history that goes much further back than the build-up to World War I. Um, some of you may be familiar with this. This is a representation of the Battle of Copenhagen of 1807, which is a piece of history that I assure you we do not learn in Canadian history classes, but I imagine, I would hope that you learn here. Uh, for those who don't know, of course, during the Napoleonic Wars, Britain was very concerned that Denmark, neutral Denmark, uh, would have its fleet seized or used or have the Baltic Sea shipping lanes cut off from British use by Napoleon coming up and allying with or conquering Denmark or whatever. So the British had a simple solution. August 1807, they sailed their ships in, bombard the city. A neutral country, not an enemy, sneak attack, kill 195 civilians, injure 800 and Oh, sorry, 768, uh, seize, confiscate the entire Dano-Norwegian uh, fleet uh, just because they could fall into the hands of Napoleon. Uh, if you want to talk about sneak attacks, we always talk about Pearl Harbor, maybe Copenhagen of 1807 would be a better example, but as appalling, as disgusting as this example of history is to you and me, to the military planners of the pre-World War I era, it says, they said, hey, sounds like a good idea. This was Admiral Sir John Jackie Fisher, a name that maybe is mostly lost to history, at least uh, regular folks, naval and military historians might know him, but he was the, uh, the first sea lord, the, the head of the British Royal Navy in that pre-World War I period. In fact, he was the first, he appointed first sea lord in 1904, and served until his retirement at the age of 70 in 1911. He came out of entire retirement for, uh, to become First Sea Lord again in 1914, because he didn't want to miss that party, a party that he had been preparing for a very long time. As soon as he came in as First Sea Lord, one of the first things that he recommended to his royal rake, the brothel grower in chief, Edward VII, was, hey, remember that Copenhagen 1807 thing? Why don't we do that to the Germans? And if you go and read his memoirs, which are available on archive.org, you can browse through them online, he brags that uh, he was one of the most hated men in Germany during that period because word had gotten out to the Germans that he was making this, this proposal. So uh, obviously Britain didn't go that route, but it was on the table at any rate and being suggested by some very high-ranking people. Do we have an equivalent from today? Unfortunately, we do. Uh, this is Admiral Scott Swift, the, uh, the head of the, uh, the commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet. And last year, he was asked, <clears throat> if you were to receive an order from the commander-in-chief, the president of the United States, to make a nuclear attack on China, would you do it? And his answer was essentially, yes. Yes, I would. And he goes on to say, well, of course, because... The commander-in-chief is the head, and I've sworn a duty to protect the Constitution from all invaders, foreign and domestic, and to uphold the, the, uh, the uh, and to fulfill the duties of uh, serving the president, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, we leave it, I guess, to the historians of a future era to go through whatever 
surfaces from the current administration to find out who was proposing what, and at what times and in what ways. But at any rate, the Copenhagen of the 21st century may be a Hiroshima Copenhagen. So, what happened during World War I? Actually, maybe a better question is what didn't happen during World War I, because it's hard for us today to even conceive how fundamentally the world changed during the course of the First World War. Uh, not least of which, the change that took place in the conception of what war even is, what, what does war look like, how is it waged, was an entirely different question at the turn of the 20th century as it was uh, in 1918 after the First World War. Uh, the invention, of course, of all the technology that had completely transformed the idea of warfare, even if they were still thinking along the lines of conventional warfare. So we have the situation of the, the trenches and the no man's land and the machine guns. We have airplanes and poison gas that completely fundamentally change all metrics of what war is and how it is waged and changes the game entirely. It's the, uh, again, what, probably one of the few things that people learn about the First World War. It's the Germans were relying on the old Schlieffen plan to go and you know, blitzkrieg through France and then hightail it back to Russia to get them before they can mobilize, uh, which was a stupid plan and they shouldn't have done it, is basically the idea. But I, I think nobody had a real conception once the war started exactly how it was going to look. Uh, the change in the monetary paradigm. Um, oh, I sh so I should say, yes, similarly, I think World War III, I don't think we can conceptualize what that even means, what it looks like. Uh, the only thing that I know for sure is that it will not look anything like World War I or World War II or previous military confrontations. It may not even be primarily military. Uh, economic warfare, uh, cyberspace wars, uh, space wars. Uh, again, our conception of what this will look like with 21st century technology is, at this point, only theoretical. Um, let's hope it maintains that way. Uh, the change in monetary paradigm. So at the beginning of World War I, the world was on a gold standard. It was largely abandoned during the course of World War I, um, leading, for example, in Britain in 1925, to an act which repealed the old gold species standard and replaced it with a gold boolean standard. So there was massive changes that were happening in the monetary paradigm as a result of the war. Um, and we are seeing some massive changes in the monetary paradigm right now. Uh, you may have seen, a, I did a recent video about China starting the Shanghai Energy Exchange, on wh which will be an oil uh, benchmark denominated in yuan. And so, for example, Russia can sell its oil to China directly uh, for yuan and take those yuan and change them on the Shanghai Gold Exchange, which opened up last year, for gold. So there's really oil for gold possible that completely goes outside the US dollar system right now. It's a fundamental change. Uh, there's some very, very large changes that are happening right now that uh, may not seem so important at first, but uh, could very well be a complete change. Uh, change in government. I don't just mean change in the actual members of government or something, but I mean even in the conception of what government is and what it can do. And probably the, the most obvious example from my Canadian perspective was the Income War Tax Act of 1917. Of course, Canada saying, hey, you know, we're in the middle of this big war. We got to keep the troops clothed and fed. We're going to just do this temporary little income tax. Just take a little bit from you every, you know. And trust us, guys. It'll only be absolutely for the, for the, for the soldiers. A uh, hundred years later, the soldiers apparently still need clothing and feeding. I don't know. Those World War I soldiers must have been really hungry. Um, in Britain, there was an income tax already, but it was greatly increased. The, the, the number of people that were subject to income tax greatly increased during the course of the war. In the US, uh, 1913, the year before the outbreak of war in Europe, um, we saw both the passage of the Federal Reserve Act and the, uh, the amendment that created the possibility for, or there's controversy about that, but theoretically created the the authority for an income tax in the United States, which again, 
started off minuscule, tiny, but in 1917, there was the uh, War Reserve Act, which greatly increased the U.S. income tax. And at that point, even people who had been very, very much against the idea of an income tax before the war, by 1917 and the outbreak of U.S. involvement in World War I, those voices had been silenced. Um, redrawing the world map, of course, famously, Oh, so I should say, of course, in World War III, in World War III scenario, one can imagine how much further governments might have to go, depending on what way that war is waged. Again, if World War III is a cyberspace phenomenon, then how are you going to crack down on that other than the militarization of the internet? Or, at any rate, a driver's license to get on the internet, or something along those lines. So again, people's conception of what is possible, what is feasible, completely changes during the course of a war, which you'll be familiar with if you've seen Norman Dodd's testimony, the, one of the researchers for the Reese Committee in the 1950s, researching the tax-exempt foundations, who had access to the Carnegie Endowment minutes from the foundation of that uh, foundation in 1908, where he said, for the first year, the board deliberated in this very intelligent, very, very high-level way, they deliberated what is the best way to change society. And over the course of that year, they came to the conclusion that there is no way better than war to change the, uh, society's outlook. And uh, so they set forth from that point in taking over the apparatus of the U.S. State Department and the U.S. foreign policy and setting the U.S. on a path towards war, which they managed to embroil it in several years later. As Norman Dodd memorably said, I don't think anything could have been further from the minds of the average American at that time in 1908-1909, but there they were planning it. Uh, redrawing the world map, uh, again, I think famously, so many of the conflicts that exist today, for example, in the Middle East, stem from the maps, the lines that were drawn on maps in conference rooms in Versailles in 1919 that have no basis in reality other than this, is, this was done to, as a concession to this person or that person, or they, you know, they had a good lunch that day, so they decided to draw the map this way. Um, and that, we still feel the effects of that today in places like Syria. Uh, redrawing the world map in the future, how will that be done in the event of a World War III scenario? Again, that's an interesting thing to think about. Will it look anything like what we understand today? And then what future wars will that uh, facilitate? A rise of new entities and powers. Uh, obviously, before World War I, there was no Soviet Union. After World War I, there was a Soviet Union, uh, most dramatically. But uh, again, many different countries were formed uh, as a result of that map drawing. So what new entities or powers might arise in a World War III scenario? It may be something not China, not US. It may be something different altogether. It may even be the wonderful globalist institution that's going to come down from the clouds to shepherd us into peace at the end of whatever havoc may be in store. And as I say, fundamental change in consciousness itself. What is, what is possible? What is impossible? People's minds were shattered by World War I. It, it's hard to, for us from our perspective to understand how fundamentally that shook the beliefs of much of humanity, that you could at least put history in some sort of sense that there's progress and we're working towards a better world. No, no, everything just fell apart. My mind is blown. I don't know what to believe anymore. That was the effect uh, for a lot of people of the First World War. And how can we say what would happen in the event of a Third World War? But perhaps the most important part of this lecture is the part that we'll spend almost the least time on. Um, but this is the fundamental underlying point of these machinations. World War I was an engineered conflict. It was not as we are taught. There was an assassination in Sarajevo and then bada bing, bada boom, World War. There was a concerted effort, as I say, with the consolidation of the Triple Entente in the years leading up to World War I, as a kind of pincher movement to, to flank Germany on the, the east with Russia and on the west with France so that Britain could get these powers to help fight their dirty war for them. Um, absolutely, there was 
there was machinations going on that were deliberate and were understood at the time, even though historians don't like to admit that. Probably the best single encapsulation, single volume encapsulation of that is Hidden History, The Secret Origins of World War I by Jerry Dougherty and Jim McGregor, which is a very, very interesting read. Uh, they may, I think they may overplay their thesis a little bit so that every single thing that happened pre-World War was all part of this plan. Mm. But at any rate, I think they do make a convincing case that there was definitely a concerted effort to engineer a First World War. And we would be naive to think that any moves towards World War III are not similarly being engineered right now. We see it with things like the invasion hysteria, which again is obvious propagandistic nonsense, but it is designed to get the average person with their popcorn and beer watching the MSM to go, I hate those guys, let's bomb them. And unfortunately, I think we all know people for whom that kind of propaganda actually works. But not just the propaganda. I have outlined in my podcast and on my website numerous times the ways that this type of uh, engineered conflict is coming together, perhaps most most notably, at least foundationally, in episode 297 of my podcast on China and the New World Order, talking about how there was, a, again, a consolidated, coordinated plan to make China into the economic and industrial engine that it is today. Uh, we have to understand that history in the context of who was the one who opened up relations with China. It wasn't Nixon. It was Kissinger who went the year before Nixon to prepare the way. And who is Kissinger? He's Rockefeller's protege. And uh, normalization of relations uh, continued apace during the Carter administration with Zbigniew Brzezinski, another Rockefeller protege there, steering things towards that. And then we have the 1980s and the development of various uh, institutions, organizations with Rockefeller right there in the heart of the mix uh, that are creating business and banking and financial ties that lay the framework, the groundwork for the industrial explosion and productivity explosion that we've seen in China over the past couple of decades. This didn't just come out of nowhere. It wasn't just China woke up one day and decided to do this. It was a coordinated effort that involved the, the, the participation of uh, the elite, no, that's a horrible word, the powers that shouldn't be from the US side as well as the powers that shouldn't be on the Chinese side. So this is the underlying reality of this. And I think it's important to keep this in mind because the most insidious thing about all of this is that in World War I, they got people to believe, at least for a short time, enough to motivate them to go and fight, that they had a reason to fight this war. That there was something, I don't know, king and country, you're dying for some glorious cause, go die. And people did. And they're trying to convince people right now that there is some kind of glorious cause that you're gonna go and fight and die for. Just trust us at this time. Well, maybe we shouldn't trust them. This is the story of Stefan Westman, a corporal in the German 29th Division, about his experience in the trenches. <clears throat> One day we got orders to storm a French position. We got in and my comrades fell right and left of me, but then I was confronted by a French corporal. He with his bayonet at the ready and, my, and I with my bayonet at the ready. For a moment I felt the fear of death, and in a fraction of a second, I realized that he was after my life exactly as I was after his. I was quicker than he was. I tossed his rifle away, and I ran my bay bayonet through his chest. He fell, put his hand on the place where I, I had hit him, and then I thrust again. Blood came out of his mouth, and he died. I felt physically ill. I nearly vomited. My knees were shaking, and I was quite frankly ashamed of myself. My comrades, I was a corporal, uh, my comrades, I was a corporal there then, were absolutely undisturbed by what had happened. One of them boasted that he had killed a poilu with the butt of his rifle. Another one had strangled a captain, a French captain. A third one had hit somebody over the head with his spade and they were ordinary men like me. One of them was a tram conductor, another one a commercial traveler, two were students, the rest were farm workers, ordinary people who never would have thought to do any harm to anyone. How did it come about that they were so cruel? I remembered then that we were told that the good soldier kills without thinking of his adversary as a human being. The very moment he sees in him a fellow man, he is not a good soldier anymore. But I had in front of me the dead man, the dead French soldier, 
and how would I like to have, ha have him raised his hand? I would have shaken his hand, and we would have been the best of friends, because he was, like me, nothing but a poor boy who had to fight, who had to go in with the most cruel weapons against a man who had nothing against him personally, who only wore the uniform of another nation, who spoke another language, but a man who had a father and mother and a family, perhaps, and so I felt. This is not an uncommon experience that we encounter in the stories of the people, the pawns, the cannon fodder that fought, that actually fought and died and spilled their blood in the trenches in World War I. There was Alan Bray of the Wiltshire Regiment. Uh, in July 1915, he was detailed to a firing squad to execute a deserter. He refused to do so. He said, I thought that I knew why these men had deserted. I understood their feelings and what would make them desert. This is what the powers that shouldn't be actually fear. What if they held a war and nobody came? What if they refused to fight? There's no way to get accurate numbers on this because, of course, the British Army or any other army didn't want them to be recorded, let alone reported. But we do know that there were 306 British soldiers that were executed, put to death by firing squad, by their own fellow servicemen for the crime of desertion or cowardice, i.e. refusing to go over the top when ordered to go basically commit suicide. 306 soldiers killed by their own for the crime of being cowards and not wanting to fight. Of course, since this is such a powerful and pervasive phenomenon, of course, there's going to be social engineering techniques to overcome it. Like the Order of the White Feather, started in August 1914 by Admiral Charles Fitzgerald and his wife, and interestingly, some suffragettes and feminists got on board, but it became a very popular phenomenon. The idea was that a woman would go to a military age man in, in England, in London, and if he was not in uniform, put a white feather on him. He is a coward. He refuses to fight. It was a phenomenon that took off. It became very popular to do this, and in fact was so effective that the British government started to worry because men who were employed in services that were in aid to the military, munitions or whatever, were not in uniform and were being labeled as cowards for not being in uniform. This was actually too effective a social engineering campaign, so the British uh, Home Secretary, Reginald McKenna, had to start issuing king and country badges that men could wear to show, I'm not in the service, but I'm, I'm an important, you know, this is important for the, the military. Uh, this is the type of social engineering that goes on to make people do things they do not want to do. And we can laugh at this as being crude, ridiculous, but are we really that immune to those types of societal pressures today? They won't look like this, but they'll feel like this. And whether bombs start dropping or whatever type of war is declared or undeclared, the societal pressure to be involved in that at least to go along with that, to support it in some way, support the troops, will be phenomenal. And people, maybe even people sitting in this room who think they can resist that kind of societal pressure, may not be able to. It's extremely powerful. But this is the point. It's an old sentiment. It's not startlingly new. It might seem corny. It might seem ridiculous. War is over if you want it? That's stupid. That's a pipe dream. Don't, don't, don't spend your days dreaming about that nonsense. Go and fight. But why? Why are they so scared of it? Why do they want you? Why do they spend so much time and energy and money and effort spent trying to propagandize you so that you believe in this cause? It's A, because no one really believes in it, it's just more BS from the same BSers that always do the same thing. And secondarily, well, because obviously they care about you and what you feel and what you believe and what you think. Your mind is the battlefield. And it's not about China and US, it's about every person on the planet and it's about conquering your mind, which is why 
maintaining our cognitive independence and not giving in to the idea that we have to fight anything for the benefit of some Kissinger-esque, horrible minion of some global order that we don't want. We have to resist that, and that is our power. Our power lies in our consciousness. So let's end this talk on a more positive note. Don't worry. Even the British government will pardon you eventually, a century later, if you desert or are a coward. Thank you. <laughs>